pen. Good evening, it's April 24th, day 37 of Malaysia's movement control order or COVID-19 lockdown. It's also the first day of Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month, and I hope that all of you watching us right now are staying safe and staying healthy. Welcome to episode four of The Point. I'm Tamina Kausji, an independent broadcast journalist, and The Point is my personal talk show where I look at the most pressing issues in the news cycle globally, regionally, and of course, in Malaysia. So watch me and join me as I speak to subject matter experts. We're always looking at the root of systemic issues and injustices, looking always also for actionable solutions. Now, on today's episode, um, we delve further into how governments in Southeast Asia, while they are also grappling with bringing the COVID-19 pandemic in their countries under control are at the same time also beginning to exert more controls over the everyday lives of citizens and of course freedom of expression. Um, I want to take a critical look at maneuverings, at special appointments, at threats or enactments of archaic repressive laws with relation to media which are also speeding along while the public is at home under lockdown and distracted by all things COVID-19. So with this wider and deeper control over the fourth estate, um, how are we to ensure that this momentary uptick in authoritarian application of governance does not then become the new normal for citizens as well as states? Will independent media and journalism be able to keep the pillars that uphold our democracies from crumbling into potential authoritarianism? Well, today on The Point, I ask these urgent questions of my two distinguished panelists. First up, she's been on Time's Person of the Year list in 2018, um, also one of Reporters Without Borders, 25 leading figures on the Information and Democracy Commission, former CNN Manila and Jakarta bureau chief, CEO and co-founder of Rappler in the Philippines, author, journalist, a living legend, Maria Reza. Hello, nice to be here. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for joining us. And next I have the trailblazing and fearless investigative journalist, author of the Sarawak Report, the inside story of the 1MDB expose. Um, her investigative work has spearheaded Malaysia's recovery just in so far of more than 1 billion USD or 4.33 billion ringgit Malaysia of funds stolen in the 1MDB corruption scandal. She is the editor-in-chief of Sarawak Report and founder of Radio Free Sarawak, the incredible Claire Rucrasel brown joining us from Spain. Hello there, lovely to be here. Awesome, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Maria, for being with us here. So let me just get the ball rolling with saying that COVID-19 is arguably the biggest story of journalists' lifetimes, and particularly for independent journalism. Uh, Maria, your thoughts on uh, this as the pandemic starts to reach that fever pitch globally? I think uh, extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. Uh, we are trying to fight a pandemic. Uh, and in this pandemic, many leaders have gotten these special powers. It's critical mm -hmm. that these special powers have an ending. And that's one of the things, the upside at least, of the special powers President Duterte was given in the Philippines. Right. And Claire, from your perspective, everything that you've observed of what's happening in Spain on one hand, where you've been for a while now under lockdowns and also over the seas in Malaysia. Yes, it's, it's been a very strange uh, kind of experience because I'm, I'm here in Spain, which has adopted a, one of the most draconian approaches uh, towards controlling this disease. They were one of the early victims um, in Europe. Um, my family are away in London, which has adopted a very different approach. So that's been an interesting um, just, uh, thing to look at um, when, you're, when you're considering, you know, how governments should be approaching uh, dealing with COVID and lockdown. Um, and of course, at the same time, really concentrating and focusing as that's where I've been writing about uh, what's been going on in Malaysia, which of course has had an extraordinary combination of both COVID breaking out at the very same time as a, an affected 
government coup. Um, and it's been very interesting watching how um, this new government has been using COVID to try and establish itself um, without uh, you know, going through to the processes um, and indeed a parliamentary vote. That's right, of course. The political chaos in Malaysia, of course, um, left uh, Malaysians without a function in government for almost two weeks, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but Maria, I wanted to move back to you and ask you, so what are the interconnected challenges right now for independent journalism to still continue functioning, particularly in this um, new normal of uh, physical social distancing whereby journalists can't actually be out there we're always out there and now we can't for the first time I in think, our uh, lifetimes at least so i think it's critical to note that the mission of journalism has never been as important as it is today but i think if you want to look at a global landscape the reporters without borders rsf just released this global report and this was a lot of it the work was done before the pandemic before the lockdown Absolutely. in every That's one right. of the countries happened right but uh, if you look at that, they basically said it's going to be a decisive decade, uh, the, the next 10 years coming up. And they looked at five things. They looked at geopolitical power. They looked at technology, the impact of technology. They looked at a crisis of trust. They looked at, uh, uh, what is the other one? Democratic, oh my gosh, democratic space, a, mm -hmm. a curtailing of democratic space. And then the last one is the economy which of course news organizations, organizations like ours are going to feel this uh, first. So it's a challenging year, but I think even more than that, even as we live in uncertainty, we are going to have to have more courage, step up even more. Power is not going to want to be challenged, nor will it want to answer questions, especially when it doesn't know the answers, right? Um, and that's why we have to keep going. Hmm. Absolutely um, poignant reminder during this time. Um, Claire, your thoughts on the same and um, where, what's the direction right now for Malaysia and particularly independent journalism in Malaysia at this critical juncture? Well, well, I think that the, the measures that have been need to be taken to protect us from this pandemic um, have been very swiftly recognised by those who find this useful um, as, as a great opportunity and excuse for authoritarianism. Um, and indeed, um, I guess one of the reasons why I'm sitting here um, to talk about uh, the situation in Malaysia is because of that very fact. Um, fellow journalists I've spoken to in Malaysia have already said back to me that they are being intimidated. Um, certainly, I have been critical of a number of things uh, that have been going wrong, in, I think, in most people's views, with the way the Malaysian government have been managing the situation um, and um, you know, treating the population. And um, I don't think many journalists in Malaysia would dare to write about these things in the way I have. Um, criticism is being uh, treated as treachery. It's, it's a, such an easy thing to do, and um, you know I've, 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 I've been roundly attacked, um, you know, via my website and, and elsewhere for raising valid criticism. And of course, it's not just Malaysia. Just just uh, look at how Donald Trump is treating his press at the moment. Um, it, it's the same. It's the same opportunity that certain governments, particular in particularly insecure ones, are likely to grab at. Um, and it presents a real challenge, uh, you know, to, to journalists who are being bullied for raising issues of public interest at this time. Hmm. Now, I love that you bring up the fact that journalists are being bullied. Um, Maria, moving back to you on not just the reason and inspiration behind why you created Rappler in the first place, but what type of um, scenario are Rappler's um, journalists um, were um, media workers, professionals dealing with right now as they're covering the pandemic? We are like you, uh, working alone, together, at home, <laughs> right? If that makes sense. Um, the technology I, connecting us all, yeah. It, it is, but again, it, it's completely new. And I think that's the challenge for us, right? This is, uh, look, Rappler has been under attack for four years from the Duterte administration because we challenged impunity in the drug war and impunity in information operations and trying to manipulate what people think, uh, what 
what the information is in the public sphere. And that is in, actually one of the key, key groups you have to look at there are American social media platforms who have allowed this to happen. So we've been under attack for four years. Uh, 2019, I was arrested twice. I was detained once. And so in a strange way, we're actually ready for this, if that makes sense. Uh, we were prepared for worst case scenarios. Uh, we are digital only, so we live online. Doing things like this is is part of our workflow to begin with. So when the lockdown happened, it was quite easy to shift to it. I think what we're not quite used to is uh, what happens to the people, to the journalists themselves, right? When you're alone and you're working from home, it means you work all the time. You, you are trying to establish connections, and yet at the same time, these connections are like online, the online world, tenuous at best. So it's a, it's a time that challenges the old definitions of journalism, but at the same time makes us absolutely certain that the foundation of journalism is critical at this time period. Yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking about the foundations of journalism, um, into Claire, your work with, of course, Sarawak Report. So what are your perspectives currently on the corruption and cronyism in Malaysia under the shadow of COVID-19? Um, of course, there was the most recent return of almost um, 300 million USD for the 1MDB cash by the Department of Justice. But how are so many other corruption and cronyism related issues getting subsumed under the COVID-19 cover? Yes, well, of course, there's a lot of concern. Nobody knows um, how that money from uh, America, which in fact I, 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 I raised that should not have been returned, given that the government um, now consists of the very people who stole it. Um, and that's an issue on its, on its own, which I raised, um, and others have uh, perhaps um, feared to do so. Um, there's also a small matter of um, billions of dollars worth of stimulus package that has been announced by this as yet unconfirmed uh, government. Uh, they've taken advantage of this COVID crisis uh, to um, keep delaying uh, calling Parliament. They've got to the stage now where they're actually breaking the fundamentals of the Constitution. They broke Parliament once um, and now they have to call it under the Constitution, but they're not actually going to allow it to sit or do any business. Um, it's the best sign that anyone in Malaysia needs to understand that actually they know that they still don't have a, a majority. So you've actually got a government that fears uh, a vote because it can't it can't actually govern. It doesn't have um, you know the legitimacy of the numbers in parliament. So it's put through a massive stimulus package, and there's been no. It's not been verified in parliament. It's not been argued over. It's the details of it are not understood, and yet it's carrying on. You know, as if it had some legitimate right to raise and spend this money. Um, of course, parliaments all over the world have actually been recalled, but it's very convenient in Malaysia not to recall it and to use this uh, COVID uh, pandemic as an excuse uh, rather than calling parliament and, 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 and sitting in a careful way so that the business can be done. Um, now, um, Malaysian media who raise these issues um, are doing so very carefully, normally by quoting protests of the opposition. Um, but um, of course, it's convenient to um, retaliate very, very aggressively against that sort of coverage. Um, to criticize, as I've said, um, that sort of coverage and indeed opposition um, politicians who mention these facts, um, you know, for being treacherous, for, for undermining the national effort and so forth. Um, I have found myself sadly dragged back into covering corruption issues because there, there have been instances of concern about the way the money that has been distributed for food aid seems not to have been spent properly. Um, particularly in Sarawak, there are stranded communities who are unable to get food because the food is not going into opposition areas. Um, the, um, the budgets for um, uh, opposition MPs have been put in the hands and under the control of, of, of 
state government MPs. Um, and those state government MPs don't seem to be managing to distribute to the opposition. Or what distributions are taking place are being emblazoned with pictures and names of government politicians, which is another form of corruption. Um, food parcels turning up are, you know, minuscule compared to the supposed money that people have been told um, they will be getting, um, you know, um, the equivalent of in goods. So That's all right. this going on. One of the worst examples, um, I, I have to say, in Sarawak, which is where I, I attempt to focus on, um, sure. although everybody's been put into lockdown, so the communities have all been told they're not allowed out of their longhouses to tend their gardens, uh, the logging companies and plantation companies have been given an exemption. And this is contrary to all safety, because of course these companies, these vast companies, um, hire crowds of um, underprotected migrant workers and, and, and who have not been properly, you know, uh, taken care of or examined. Now these, these, in one example, a community that was fighting against a logging company that had been moving in and taking over their lands uh, for plantations, um, they're forced to stay indoors and the logging companies taken advantage of the situation to go and mow over their gardens, destroy their crops and uh, take the land that they've been fighting to get. Um, so these are the sorts of subjects that, um, you know, I I am covering, um, as are some others, but it's, it's, it's difficult because the journalists have been criticized for doing so. That's right. And you're not, of course, on the ground anymore at the moment. From there, Maria, moving back to you. Uh, now, you've also spoken of the virus, quote unquote, infecting democracy. On the flip side, how are um, some Filipinos also um, challenging threats to their freedom of expression by speaking up in the digital sphere? It's fascinating and actually, mm. you know, perhaps a silver lining, if this makes sense. Uh, you know, we've written a lot about the information operations that the Philippine government uh, it implicitly supports at best and funds. If, if, uh, uh, and what we've seen now is that these six waves of, of trying to manipulate public opinion uh, is taking a back seat to real Filipinos who are working from home and who are online on social media. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if you don't know that for the fifth year running, the Philippines is number one in terms of the the amount of people on Facebook. It's something. Right. Like, <laughs> it's some, and, well, that and makes I, sense though, makes sense. Facebook is still number one, still kingmaker. And the problem with that, of course, is unlike journalists who used to be gatekeepers to the public sphere, technologists, social media platforms essentially allow lies to, laced with anger and hate to spread faster than facts. And that's problematic. That's exactly what authoritarian style governments all around the world have taken advantage of. What we saw in the Philippines is a government that, you know, when when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when our lockdown was announced on March 12th, uh, it took place Two days later, uh, President Duterte was backed by men in uniform behind him. And the details that he gives are details about the checkpoints outside, about what will happen to you if you violate quarantine. And on April 1, he actually said, uh, if you violate quarantine, he encouraged uh, troops to shoot them dead. Uh, you know, they later tried to pull this back, but you have President Duterte on camera telling troops to shoot them dead. And that's exactly what has happened. A day later, a 63-year-old farmer uh, was stopped at a checkpoint. He wasn't wearing a mask, right? And that's why they stopped him. But he was also drunk. At least this is what the police report said. And the, the village captain tried to stop him. He was yelling and they called in a policeman and then he took out a bolo knife. And because of that, he was shot. He was killed. Yeah. That's the first death. Just uh, today, one of our stories is uh, a former army, some some a man who had PTSD from the military. Uh, yesterday was at a, again at a checkpoint, and he was killed by the policeman there. There's now supposedly an investigation. When your leader says shoot them dead in dealing with a virus, and people are afraid and they don't know 
whether they're afraid for themselves, right? It, it yeah. causes unnecessary fear and panic. And for the policemen and the and the soldiers on the front lines, the first the first thing they do is is actually uh, is pull out a gun, and it's a tough thing for Filipinos to deal with. Having said that, when the president said shoot them dead, right, if there had been a brewing um, kind of uh, galvanization online. And what happened was President, when right after President Duterte said that, hashtag Aus Duterte now trended to number one overnight into April 2 and hit number one globally as well, which is shocking. This is this would have been unheard of uh, before the time of the pandemic. So I think for this administration, the pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 virus hits two problematic points of how they got power. The hmm. first is that they manipulated, they learned to manipulate information. But in these times, you actually need facts. Facts Very true. matter, right? And then the second thing is this is an administration that tore people apart using social media platforms that designed filter bubbles into their into the way they work, right? So our polarization of society was part of the way this administration got and retained power. Now it must spearhead and lead social cohesion. You know, it must unite us in order to be able to deal with the virus well. So those are upsides. The government is learning. It's been very slow, but, you know, the testing has increased and, uh, Checkpoints are still the main point. In place, President yeah. Duterte. President Duterte again gave a national address this morning, extending our lockdown another two weeks, just like uh, you guys. Um, but you know, I'm hoping. I guess the, all you can do is hope, right? Yeah, all you can do is hope, and it's also, uh, I, I think, an unprecedented opportunity for governments that have been peculiarly authoritarian to understand the importance of not just journalism, but also of bringing together, as you said, a cohesive source of information instead of, you know, uh, playing around with uh, disinformation, misinformation, and bandying independent journalism as quote unquote fake news. Right. So from there, um, Claire, I wanted to move into uh, looking at the political strategic culture of um, Southeast Asian countries. Um, it's generally to maneuver behind major public distractions. COVID-19, of course, being a perfect example. Um, do you have any other interesting examples that you can relate towards this? Well, yes, I, I, clearly um, Malaysia is, is doing exactly that. I mean, um, um, they, they were taken by surprise by COVID. Um, you know, they've been plotting a coup. They hadn't expected this to break out. And in fact, they ignored the, the problem until journalists, including myself, uh, pointed out that um, they were ignoring a massive pandemic while they were focusing on their political maneuverings. But, you know, I think, I think um, this is a chance for journalists to really carry on and do what they do. Um, and Maria, yes, uh, the, the public are being manipulated deliberately by powerful and authoritarian uh, figures um, through uh, platforms like Facebook. But um, my experience in Malaysia with the one MTP crisis was that if journalists keep doing what they do and, and, and sticking to facts, being objective, um, balancing their arguments, um, you know, corroborating their arguments, um, in the end, you, you win through. Uh, and I think, you know, with this COVID crisis, where so much, you know, is flying around, um, people start to go back to people they know they can trust because they operate in a professional way and are disinterested. Um, and journalists have to be disinterested in the public interest. Um, they have, you know, not, they shouldn't be factionalizing for one political group or another, um, although, of course, media outfits do. Um, you know, journalists who remain who right in the public interest will uh, be gravitated towards. And right now, you're seeing the Malaysian government uh, doing all manner of things under, under the COVID um, under the cover of COVID. You know, they've been chucking out um, huge numbers of officials from positions, putting their own cronies into place. They've been uh, putting uh, MPs into top uh, 
uh, uh, publicly owned company jobs, um, massive corrupt practice, um, all with a view to trying to um, get control of the levers of power under the cover of COVID. And really, it's it's for journalists to write about this, to expose it, to challenge it, um, so that people know what's going on. And my experience with one MDB is that people do, in the end, uh, come to the factual conclusions um, yeah. if the journalists are doing their jobs. And that's why we need to be there bravely, doggedly, standing up to all this, pointing out what's going wrong, um, so that people do have that resource of information, of objective information in the public interest. That's right. It does have to come back to the truth. Now, um, Maria, coming back to you, um, speaking about the triple extinction threat that uh, independent journalism is facing, particularly at this juncture, you've got uh, disinformation, which is continuing on, of course, at the same time, uh, government restrictions in various Southeast Asian countries and economic calamity. So when it comes to sustainability for independent journalism and outlets uh, such as yours, Rappler, um, are there any solutions, uh, any silver linings that you see? Or is it all really just day by day, day by day? Uh, in a strange way, I'm going to say we're lucky and that mm -hmm. there is a silver lining. Lucky in the sense that, uh, uh, I'll give you a, an example that's personal. Uh, one of the eight cases that the government filed last year, I posted bail eight times. and. Uh, uh, one of those cases was supposed to have had a verdict on April 3rd. And that that's probably the fastest court case that we've had in the Philippines. That's at least what we're right? <laughs> Yeah, it was like, it was yeah. less than eight months, is about eight months. And so April 3rd, because we had a lockdown, it got postponed to April 24th, a new date. And now it's been postponed indefinitely. And I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to is that a lot of these politically motivated charges will lose their sting and our judges can behave independently according to the spirit of the law. As we get closer to elections, which are going to be, campaigns are going to begin, it's funny, power politics and, and campaigns still rule, right? So so, so there's one. I, I am looking forward to a better sense of uh, an executive that doesn't put its fingers in the, on the scale. Uh, the second thing is that because we had been under attack for four years before this, we were actually prepared economically. We were forced to find an alternative revenue stream to advertising because in 2018, by April 2018, when we had all these cases thrown at us, 50% uh, of our advertisers dropped. And, you know, we were like, we spent a month saying, what do we do that other companies would want? And we cleaved off a, a B2B uh, business model that is different right. from advertising. So that's, and, and it finds its roots in what investigative journalists do, which was the research we were doing on disinformation, on the networks of disinformation and how you can track this down. Um, finally, the third part that's a silver lining for me is that, look, uh, I agree that journalists, investigative journalism in the end will win, but technology has really made that significantly harder. Uh, great book, 750 pages long, longer than yours. <laughs> but this book by Shoshana Zuboff calls it uh, surveillance capitalism. Oh, yes. But surveillance yes, capitalism, yes. Right? Definitely on my to-read list, yeah. So you take that, how these companies, these platforms actually have so much data on us and with the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence that they know us in far more intimate ways than the than we even know ourselves and that they sell a point of decision making to the highest bidder to whoever will do that whether it is a government or a corporation um, when you take that and then you put together something that all governments have been doing and you know i had just interviewed edward snowden and he was just saying look I did that seven years ago. What I was, what he was a whistleblower for something, this massive surveillance that was happening seven years ago. You take that together with surveillance capitalism, where these companies working with governments actually are, you know, far more powerful than many governments. And then they can be twisted and used by governments if they want to keep operating. A perfect example is what Vietnam did to Facebook 
just, uh, I think it was last week, right? Uh, they choked the traffic of Facebook until Facebook agreed to uh, take down content that the government thought was anti-government. And this is the second time Facebook has done that. The first time they did it was in Cambodia. So this is problematic, but here's a silver lining. I'll get to the silver lining. These platforms took down content that's mm. connected to the pandemic. Uh, they took down Bolsonaro from Brazil, President Bolsonaro. You know, they took him down because it was dangerous to health. And then uh, they took down Giuliani. Again, similar things, things that they had never done before. And I think one of the things we have to do is to remember that not only can they do it, that they will do it. Because the the conventional wisdom always, what they'll always say is that, well, you don't want us determining what content stays in the public sphere. And the response I always have to that is, your algorithms are already doing that now. That's this right. is not a freedom of speech issue. It is a freedom of distribution, right? It mm -hmm. is freedom of reach. And I'll quote Sacha Robert Cohen in something like that. Uh, and what tends to get uh, rep to get distributed more are half truths, half lies uh, that are laced with anger and hate. So we need to move beyond that. So that's a silver lining. I hope that we will get to a place where legislation is not the only solution, although increasingly we're finding that capitalism, the, the profit motive, and the public sphere, protecting the public interest, that these are really clashing when it comes to tech. Yeah. And it's uh, it's literally taken a pandemic to put this into broad focus. And it's literally taken a pandemic to put this into broad focus. Half truths, half lies today during the COVID-19 pandemic can actually result in loss of life yes. outright, even though that has already been occurring due to hate speech and disinformation in the past. Um, Claire, I wanted to ask uh, you now, uh, so how do you keep the fire burning for independent journalism during times of despots? So Claire's actually off a little bit. Maria, I'll continue on with you. Her line just fell for a little bit there. Um, what has Rappler done in particular, Maria, to be able to address the type of targeted hate speech that comes towards not only the platform, but even yourself as an entity on social media and journalism? I think it's the same problem solving methodology we need for the virus. Mm -hmm. Figure out the, the facts. So we went for the data. We took a look at the data. We, we Once we found that, we mapped the social networks that were doing this, and then we published it. We do what journalists do. And that was the way we were able to see how there have been six waves of information, six waves of uh, networks that have been pushing mm -hmm. pro-Duterte, pro-government agenda. Uh, interestingly, they have just recently moved from Facebook to Twitter. And during this time, in the while we've been in lockdown, what they did was Twitter actually took down pro-Duterte accounts uh, that were responding to the anger, uh, justifiable anger of Filipinos looking for mm -hmm. answers beyond the gun. That's right. So it moves from Facebook, it moves into Twitter. Um, Claire, coming back to you. Now, um, what is your idea about how the fire can be kept burning for independent journalism, particularly for much smaller organizations? Sarawak Report is still a website and its sustainability and survival during these times. Should, it, should we take into consideration um, the certain calls that have started coming out from journalist networks over the past few weeks that social media giants, the Facebooks, the Twitters, should be paying for having your news up on their feeds? What do you think of that? Well, it's a very interesting thought, isn't it? Um, really, if Facebook is starting to censor anti-government or uh, government disapproved mm. content in oppressive countries uh, like Cambodia and Vietnam, they're really beginning to lose what vestiges of moral uh, justification they have. Um, and um, I think one of the things one has to do, the silver lining in the, in the technology, Maria, I think, is that small outfits like us actually can impact um, and if you stick to a subject and you go for it, actually, um, I have found, um, uh, you know, a, a, a project like Sarawak Report can achieve far more in the investigative field than a large mainstream newspaper, um, which, which 
fails to focus, fails to um, to uh, divert resources um, into investigative um, matters, and also actually are faced with all sorts of um, problems, such as their desire not to annoy um, powerful um, advertisers or their wealthy owners, and so forth. So these are the advantages of being a small fish. Um, in that, in some ways, uh, you know, you're you're not uh, burdened with the disincentives that a big news organisation might have in, in in basically taking on some of the most powerful um, forces um, in a way that some NGOs also operate in that way. Um, so, um, you know, that, that that is the silver lining because I wouldn't have been able to operate. Um, small as I am without the internet. Um, and citizen journalists have their role um, within this. And, and it's really a question, I think, of becoming a trusted name and, and keeping at it and focusing. Um, yes, I think it would be a very, very important development for, for people to, you know, in this business, in this work, <laughs> to, to hang together, to help each other. Um, and yes, to, to get the support when needed um, from, for example, Facebook. Facebook um, made, made a lot of money out of boosting, you know, out of boosting attacks on throughout report, for example. Um, you know, they make a lot of money out of just the, the enormous amount of traffic that goes through my site. Um, yes, yeah, so, so they, they should pay for that. Um, Absolutely. And, and they, they haven't, there's no mechanism for that. Um, and um, these organizations need to be brought under control. Another silver lining out of this COVID situation has been really that uh, I think it puts pressure um, on governments. So these governments that have been taking the opportunity to be more authoritarian, to protect themselves from scrutiny, uh, to avoid parliament, to even legitimize themselves in, in the case, or, or, or seek legitimacy in the case of Malaysia, they're also, they're also being showcased um, and there has been, you know, um, and, and, and they get shown up. Um, and um, I think we're seeing governments all over the world um, being put under pressure and showing themselves what they, for what they are. Um, many people might say that in America now, people are seeing uh, mm -hmm. the, the present government there for what it is. Um, we're seeing in Malaysia, we've seen extraordinary action, acts of hypocrisy. So um, it's not as bad as the Philippines um, in terms of, of what's been, what police have been doing, but there have been some appalling abuses of civilians being you know, hauled and thrown into overcrowded COVID threatening situations in jail uh, for minor infractions, um, forced to, caned in public, humiliated and forced to squat in the case of women in public, um, just for supposedly violating these, um, Orders, which of course, time and again, we're seeing the most powerful people in this new government violating themselves. So the, the new prime minister has been you know, playing golf, going shopping with his wife. Uh, his the, the deputy health minister was 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 uh, found the other day uh, socialising in a school picnic. Uh, all things that would have seen jail for others. Um, and this is, you know, this resonates. The public is seeing the government for what it is. Um, and, and, and that's important. Um, you know, they've made terrible blunders and shown enormous, um, you know, uh, intelligence deficits. Uh, you know, the, the health minister himself referred to having had a meeting with um, at the WHO with 500 other, other countries. Um, again, you know, Malaysia is laughing at him. Um, he's demonstrated a sort of rather basic lack of intelligence. So, um, you know, the, this crisis is also a, a very, very stringent test for these governments um, and the reckoning will come if they fail that test. Yeah, a beautiful litmus test. And for those who are just joining us, this is episode four of The Point um, featuring COVID-19 and the role of independent journalism in upholding democracy. I'm speaking today, of course, to my incredible panelists, Maria Reza, CEO, co-founder of Rappler in the Philippines, together with also Sarawak Reports editor-in-chief, Claire Rucastle brown If you've got any questions or comments, please do leave them for us and we'll actually uh, play them across the screen towards the end of the panel which will be coming up in just a little bit more so moving forth and moving further now um, I want to go into both your experiences being female journalists in independent and investigative media so that's the big elephant in the room but let's unravel it a little shall we uh, Maria what are some of the worst threats that you have received 
personally as a female investigative independent journalist and um, why do you think this still continues on the misogyny the invective the vitriol that comes towards us I think threats to journalists have evolved over time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the same way that the world has also evolved. And what's most interesting to me is with the internet, I, I just didn't expect what happened in 2016. When you have a leader who is sexist at best, misogynist, a, a misogynist at worst, and his you know nationwide addresses are laced with misogynistic statements. Uh, it ripples through the society and I, I think that these are the things, the exponential attacks on social media. You can always say sticks and stones may break my bones, right? But words will never hurt, hurt me. Uh, but it's not quite true because it is a new weapon. The pounding is psychological. It's a new weapon that is effectively used against women. In the Philippines, the data we had showed that women were attacked online with these misogynistic statements at least 10 times more than men were. This was a new powerful tool for, for putting people back, journalists back in their place. Um, but what we've learned is that you keep going. You know, you take it. Uh, so when did it begin? July of 2016, not coincidentally, with the start of the drug war. And the first people who were attacked were actually not the journalists, but the people who were challenging the deaths in the drug war. Because the, the at that point in time in July of 2016, we were we were hitting eight my one reporter would come home and every night she would have eight different dead bodies on the sidewalk of manila right and then at its peak during that time period there were uh 33 deaths every night this was what the figures had shown um so the propaganda machine attacked those people but what we saw after that was that as claire said when the investigative journalists did their work, they changed their behavior. So it didn't stop the killings. It just went to the provinces um, because it was an effective tool to maintain control and to rule with fear. Uh, so what do we do in Rappler? Uh, by, so that happened in July, by October, sure. by August. We actually had to take, uh, give, we gave counseling sessions for uh for our journalists, anyone who wanted it at that point. Rappler is young. Our median age is 23 years old, and it is 63% women. And yeah. so, you know, we- And that, is, that in itself is incredible. 63% women, wow, and it, investigative. It, it really wasn't by design. You know, I keep, mm. we're, I keep saying we're an equal opportunity employer. Men, where are you, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but what was interesting to me during that time is we almost became our own club when we came under such intense attack. It's, and you talk to each other and you counsel each other. Uh, when we went to, our, to the counselors here in the Philippines, we realized how new it was because we had to ask DART to come in to train the trainers. Uh, and then this normalized over time. And then they moved on to other targets. And uh, it was the data that showed us this exponential pounding that they did it for two reasons. One is to silence a narrative they don't like. And the second is once they silence it, they can actually take over the public sphere. So it it worked for a time. It's not working now. And I guess that also is a silver lining. Yeah, because you definitely need to address it actionably like what Rappler has been doing. Um, Claire, moving to you on the same question from how your work is read, rebutted, questioned, and even the language used when it comes to refusing your revelations in the past and ongoing. How is the dimension changed on the sole basis of your gender, the fact that you are a female investigative journalist? And how do you think we can also as media begin to address how rampant this is, not just in Southeast Asia, but globally for female journalists? Well, um, I always see it as a sign of, of insecurities and weaknesses. Uh, if, if a man seeks to um, you know, be abusive towards a woman on the grounds of her sex, uh, he's rather giving his own insecurities away. Um, and um, 
you know, most most secure and able men, of whom there are very many, obviously, um, don't need to behave or fall back on that sort of behavior. Um, and so people need to be reminded that they reveal themselves um, by their misogyny. But that's really, um, you know, not much consolation for people like Maria, who are down on the ground, um, threatened by it, um, not just verbally, but also um, in its, you know, in, in its more physical form. And, and that's always a, a problem that women have faced, violence, because we're not so strong. Um, and there's a lot of reference to violence, and it's coming back. What's interesting is it's coming back uh, with the new, new government, the, re the re return to power, of the people who have been stood up to before the last election um, has seen a, a flourishing now. They've crawled back from under their stones, these, these, these people, and are, are, are repeating these sorts of attacks. Um, as an investigative journalist, I've often found it rather useful um, to, to be a woman. Um, I find that criminals are often people um, who aren't going to come top in the normal courses of life, so they fall back on criminal behavior because they can't win by the rules. So they tend to be a bit silly. And, um, and they tend to therefore think that women are stupid. And that's really helpful if you're trying to get invest, you know, get information out of people. It, it's a real advantage if they start by thinking that you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Using the stereotype to the benefit of one. That's right. So uh, from there, though, uh, Maria, Claire, we've actually got um, two questions that we're going to take and queue in so that we've got some time to address also the viewers who have been, you know, watching, anticipating and just crafting their comments. Can we bring on the first one? So this comes from Yusuf Abdul Rahman. He's asking Maria. Maria spoke about challenges that especially affect online dependent, social led media entities. What practical tips can Maria give to help independent journalists and media organizations build an immunity to quote unquote platform capture, regardless of what the next new social platform may be? Maria? I think this connects to where technology is going to go next. And this is there is going to be a wave of regulation, right? So one of the things that I found interesting in, in the United States is this idea that we own our own data, right? So one of the things that's in, is if we can actually get our data, look, the incentives for, for a company like Facebook actually doesn't lead them to protect the users. In fact, it leads them the other way. If you look, when they spent more money to try to work for data privacy, they were pounded by the markets. When they announced this, they actually lost uh, market share. So uh, I think the first is if, if we can get to a point where people, users own their data, and if I feel like a platform isn't protecting me enough that I and my friends can leave and take that data somewhere else, I think that's very powerful. But I think here's the other part that you have to see. What happens online doesn't stay online, right? I've talked a lot about the, the social media attacks, but a year later, those were followed by the weaponization of the law. So these are just weapons and new ways of fertilizing public opinion to the direction that a government wants an action perhaps that may not be publicly palatable becomes more palatable by seeding it first on social media. And you can see this in the arrest of Senator Lila de Lima, for example. This is a, she's a very prominent critic of President mm -hmm. She investigated him when she was head of the Commission on Human Rights and he was the mayor of Davao City for uh, human rights violations. And she was the cautionary tale for politicians early on. She's been in prison since February 2017, effectively without a trial. Uh, and because Duterte took such strong measures, it also cautioned other politicians from speaking up. So these are the things, what happens online, oftentimes is a harbinger of what is going to happen next in the real world. That's right. Normalizing certain narratives. Very true. Well observed. Thank you, Maria. Uh, from there, we move into um, questions that we have for Claire. Can we bring them up? So Eric Ho is asking Claire. Claire mentioned about 1MDB. Would um, Najib walk free given the current um, UMNO governing, according to Eric Ho? 
Well, this is um, this really has been on the cards uh, from the beginning with this um, this backdoor government. Um, it depends on uh, Najib and his party uh, for it to have a hope of uh, gaining enough support to to govern. Um, it's a very moot point whether it has a sufficient number of MPs now. If it was to lose Najib himself, or certainly Amno, it would be a a small minority within the parliament. Um, so um, what do we think the real reason behind this coup was? Of course, the driving reason for these powerful politicians in UMNO, many of whom are facing very serious charges that would land them in jail, um, above all has to be to secure their freedom. Um, that comes before any other political objective they may claim to have. Um, and Najib has already he, uh, been not able to resist um, triumphantly uh, announcing in several different ways on his Facebook that he expects his trial to end positively for him. Such as, uh, to, to the very extent that over the last few days, he's, he's announced that when his trials have ended positively for him, he will set about um, suing me. Um, so therefore, um, yes, I'm afraid that is part and parcel of what's happened in Malaysia. This has been a, a, a very powerful government that controlled the country with a fairly phony democratic process um, for six decades, um, lost power because its corruption became um, so blatantly exposed that um, people voted it out. And in the last two years since that election, uh, these power mongers have been working one way or another to get together enough MPs from round about the place uh, to try and establish this coup. It's all been about, um, you know, um, uh, power and wealth and establishment, uh, you know, um, muscle. Uh, to try and force out um, an elected government. Um, they've yet to complete the coup. Uh, they've yet to establish that they, you know, they, they've been using this time to try and buy over MPs with jobs and cabinet positions. Um, but they think, you know, that they, they you know, they, they, they obviously have sufficient um, confidence that uh, Najib should make such uh, what, what would appear to be very unwise remarks showing exactly what his game, game plan is. That's right. Very uh, concisely observed, Claire. Now we've got one last question, which is for both uh, Maria and Claire. Let's bring that on. Um, Gerald Kaur asking, as much as independent journalists strive to keep governments covered and hopefully a little more honest, it's a mountain of a battle against mainstream media channels and their respective followers who act as government mouthpieces. What kept you both going through the years and do you see progress reaching and getting heard by a wider segment of the public? Uh, Maria. Uh, luckily, attacks of the Duterte administration against media began business-wise. It was an attack mm. on the owners of companies, right? It was an attempt to intimidate uh, news organizations from taking action. And, and the threat was very real. I have tax evasion cases, you know, six months after the Philippine government actually gave us an award for being a top corporate taxpayer. It doesn't matter. These things don't matter anymore. Um, my, so, my. Uh, yeah. I think in our in 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 Rappler's case, part of what we were able to do was to capture 18 to 35 years old. And that was also part of the reason we became a target for the government. President Duterte, before he became president, used our platform to actually kind of kick off his campaign, right? Uh, because we covered him as we did the other four candidates with him. So we have scaled. And the best part here, though, is because we refused to be intimidated, it was actually our community that helped keep us afloat. And I'm sure, Claire, this is kind of similar to your experience. I was shocked when the legal cases began and we weren't prepared for the money to shell out for this. We did a crowdfunding campaign and it was the largest that any group in the Philippines had, any news group had gotten. And it helped pay for our early legal fees, right? And that, that also kicked us into beginning a membership, uh, uh, a way for Filipinos who believe in the values of democracy. And I guess this is the most important thing. In this day and age, 
you need to be clear what your values are. Journalists have a set, set of standards and ethics. I always ask tech what their standards and ethics are, right? And I, I get oftentimes optimization. Um, so these standards and ethics are the rallying point. There should be the rallying point of around our leaders. These standards and ethics are critical. That is how we pull communities together. And that is how news groups, independent news groups will scale. Mm, absolutely. Speaking truth to power and holding everyone accountable while bringing in the general public. Um, Claire, your thoughts on the same as well. What do you see as the future? Is it going to, particularly in, in a post-COVID world, as hopefully in the months and the year to come, um, lockdowns actually ease? What will be the role? I think um, pendulum swing. Um, we, so they do. The, the liberal, we of the liberal world, I suppose, the democratic world, um, have been probably horrified by some of the populism um, of which um, the Philippines has uh, formed a part over the last few years. And we wonder where, how far it might go. <coughs> of course, it could go. It could go further. Um, but hopefully. Um, swing the other way um, and, and and in a way that's what we as journalists have to have to put our back into because it could get worse um, we've all seen that we've all seen the, the era of, of the world wars um, where um, fascism uh, caused havoc and destruction and death um, and cruelty from which we came out having learned several lessons um, it could get as bad as that or people will calm down and we push the other way and we see through people who are seeking to exploit anger and divisiveness um, and uh, institute authoritarian regimes. Um, it's for us to, to keep up, to, to, to continue to be a voice. And that's the role I play in Malaysia. I, I know I have enormous support amongst the uh, journalist community in Malaysia. Um, anyone who becomes a journalist wants to tell the truth. They don't want to be a propaganda mouthpiece for an illegal, corrupt um, government. They want to speak up for the people and tell the truth. And, and it's that support. I mean, I, I, I focus on Malaysia because I was born there. I am native born. That's on my certificate. I'm a Bumu Putra. Um, but of course, yeah. <laughs> years ago, um, but I'm constantly attacked for being a foreigner sticking my nose in. What keeps me going is the support of, of, of the many hundreds of thousands of people who, who read the stories that I, that I am I am able to write. And people um, in Maria's situation in Malaysia just can't keep their businesses if they do. That's right. Thank you for that, Claire. Now, I'd like to end with asking each one of you um, to share your personal message towards um, independent journalists during these tying times and also as we all move towards coming out into the new normal. Maria? I don't think we know what the new normal is going to be and I don't think we have an idea of how bad our economies, the globally and individual economies are going to be hit by this, right? But I think, you know, it's funny. For many years, we are, our motto was hashtag inspire courage, right? Just right around the time when our lockdown began in Manila, we switched it to hashtag courage on. Courage on, because this isn't just about journalists. What we're seeing in many ways is a destruction of kind of the world as we knew it. And now you can't just sit back and watch it being destroyed without jumping in to try to create what the new world is going to be. As a journalist, it just means we need to push forward uh, much stronger, much further, think through what journalism is going, how it's going to evolve in this day and age where we're stuck in our homes, where government officials will reel out numbers. How can we check those officials? What are leading indicators we can use as checks against that, right? Uh, but journalism itself as a profession is changing because our businesses are under threat. How is that going to work? Especially when you know, you're talking in the Philippines, 99.5% of our economy is powered by MSMEs. And there's been no aid for them yet at this point. So there's going to be massive upheaval. There's going to be massive destruction. I think each one of us should step in front of it and say, here, this is the way I want to see my world. And kind of like in your own patch, make it happen. 
Yeah, courage on indeed. Yep, brilliant. Um, Claire, I want to ask you also your personal message towards independent journalists, not only in the region, but particularly in Malaysia, as we all as Malaysians live through these extraordinary times. Well, I think one of the consequences of the lockdown is that we've all been perhaps given a, a little sort of opportunity to step out of our lives a bit and, and think a bit and think about the world we live in for once, um, all of us. Um, and I'm seeing everywhere, I think, um, both in Malaysia and the United Kingdom, here in Spain, um, a sort of understanding of our common interest again, remembering that we're a community. Uh, remembering that we're not only just one community, but we're a global community. Um, and, you know, we can't even ignore that. So dividing, fighting, winners and losers, in the end, we need each other. And I, I hope that message comes out. I hope that we, we take a step back from the aggressive tone that has um, dominated, um, you know, the media and indeed the discourse for so many years as we perhaps become complacent about so many of the gifts that, um, that maybe our forefathers left us as we came out of bad times before at the start of the last century. Um, perhaps we should remember some of those, those common values, that the person who cleans the streets is really just as important to us as the person who runs the big company and should be treated with respect. Um, and I hope that that civilized discourse comes back, um, you know, into the way we operate as journalists um, and hopefully in the way that people um, behave in public. Um, we, we need, we're in this together on this planet and, and I think most people are beginning to feel that way um, and let's hope it leads for, you know, more pleasant times. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Claire. So courage on from Maria and a message for shared humanity as well as still holding power accountable from Claire. Um, Maria, Claire, thank you so much for joining us. Would you please uh, wait for a brief moment backstage while I get back to you for a post-show chat? And in the meanwhile, thank you so much for everybody who has joined us here on episode four of The Point with Maria Reza, CEO, co-founder of The Rappler Philippines, and Claire Rucastle brown editor-in-chief, Sarawak Report. Thanks, you all. So from there, moving into... Um, the pandemic, it has allowed, of course, governments to take advantage of the fact that politics are on hold, the public is stunned, and protests are out of the question in order to impose measures that would be impossible in normal times. Now, this is a quoted statement from Christophe Villois, the Secretary General of Reporters Without Borders, who in this release of their statement and their report on just this Tuesday observed the following. Now, why should we be discussing um, democracy, freedom of expression, and even the independent journalism's role during COVID-19? It's a time of global economic, industrial, and even, of course, emotional and psychological turmoil for us as global citizens, simply because the very principles of our collective freedoms and basic human rights are never more at risk than they have been under the cover of COVID-19 lockdowns globally and regionally. Thank you so much for joining me, Tamina Kausji, on this essential episode of The Point. And until next time, stay safe, stay home, and stay informed. It's been a pleasure. See you all then.